It's certainly been a great joy to be here and to have this fellowship with you and have my life so wonderfully enriched by this fellowship of yours. And I pray that God will use my feeble, if prolonged, <laughs> efforts to uh, be of benefit to you and to the work of your churches as you look out upon the world. And we want to think together tonight about the pastor's role in leading a church to be mission-minded. My subtitle, or really my preferred title, is uh, Channels, Not Reservoirs, or maybe more accurately, Irrigation Canals, Not Reservoirs. A number of years ago, while living in Brazil, I had spent several days in the city of Petrolina on the second largest river of South America, about four or five hundred miles from the coast, where after three years of prolonged drought, it was so hot that even at night the sandy streets burned through the soles of one's shoes. And many thousands of people were sleeping on the streets or down by the riverside after padding through the blistering hot sands all day long, begging for a few alms or crumbs to eat. They'd been driven from the farms and ranches where they had lived their lives heretofore by this drought because there was no water to be had at their homes. And so it was with great relief that I boarded an ancient DC-3 one morning to fly out of that hot, burned, scorched place. But my relief was short-lived, for as we flew north, I looked out the windows of that plane and all I could see, stretching for hundreds of miles in every direction, was earth that seemed to have been covered by molten asphalt, so barren it was. I had driven through that countryside on other occasions when the fields were covered with luxurious green corn, cotton bushes, almost trees that produced long staple cotton, some of the finest of the whole world, producing for 12 or 15 years without replanting. Fat, sleek cattle had grazed the green pastures, but now there was nothing but desolation and death. I thought of the words of Isaiah, the stream shall be turned into pitch, and its loose earth into brimstone, and its land shall become burning pitch, it shall not be quenched night or day. In a vain attempt to shut out from my mind that sight of death, I leaned back and closed my eyes, and after a long while I looked out again, and still my eyes were greeted with the same sad desolation. But as we flew on over scorched earth, an hour or so later, as I looked out the window, suddenly I came alive, for there was a little green patch down below me. Beautiful flowers, gorgeous vegetable gardens around three or four houses, a veritable oasis. And again I thought of the words of Isaiah, the wilderness and the desert will be glad and the desert will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. What made the difference? You know, of course, water made the difference. There was a small lake and a few hundred yards of irrigation canals. And I thought of a time when Jesus stood talking to a woman whose life was as scorched almost as was that land over which we flew. And he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says unto you to give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Whoever drinks of this water shall get thirsty again. 
but he that drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. But he shall have within him a spring of artesian water bubbling over into life eternal. And I thought also of that occasion in John chapter 7, when on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood and with a loud voice cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. For the difference Jesus makes in a life is no less dramatic and spectacular than the difference water made in that desert when one truly knows him and lives in his companionship. I thought of some of the men and women I had known whose lives had been as marvelously transformed as was the life of that woman at the well. Some of them from lives scorched by immoralities and lust and passion. Others morally correct but arrogantly proud, suffering as much devastation and death as the grossly immoral. And yet I had seen some of those changed from a life of concentrated self-centeredness when they came to know Jesus Christ to a life that was poured out as a libation as they literally burned themselves out for the benefit of the salvation and education and blessing of others. But as I thought of those people, I thought of an enormous lake in another state where I had worked in Brazil. And I had many times crossed that third largest earth-filled dam of the world and looked out upon the beginning of the waters that backed up for many, many miles. A huge reservoir. But all around that lake, the earth was just as barren as this tabletop because there were no irrigation canals. Land that could have been as productive as those gardens I had seen from the plain were utterly desolate for lack of channels. And I was reminded of some churches and some individuals I knew who considered themselves to be reservoirs of grace never once recognizing that God did not intend for them to be reservoirs, but rivers of living water, allowing that water of life to flow through them to a burned and scorched and desolate world around them. That they were expected to be irrigation canals. Never had they comprehended that to try to save the grace of God exclusively for self is like the Israelites trying to save the manna from day to day and it's spoiled. There are some things you cannot experience by attempting to save them, to guard them. You only experience them as you give them away. Electricity, in order to cause these light bulbs to shine, to illumine this auditorium, has to get through the light bulb or it never gets to it. And the grace of God has to get through us to others or we never truly experience it. As Dr. Carver wrote, the saved are elect not merely as individuals destined to eternal personal salvation, but are chosen and called 
to participate in the plan of salvation which God is working through Jesus Christ to save the world, not just you, but through you to the world. The world in which we live is spiritually famine-stricken. It, too, is scarred, desolate, barren. And you and I are to become the irrigation canals, yea, more, the rivers, channeling the living water to every individual of the 5,200,000,000 people in this world in which we live until it blossoms abundantly like the crocus. The question naturally arises, how can we pastors lead churches to become mission-minded, to become rivers instead of reservoirs? My first suggestion would be we ourselves must have and must cultivate in fellow believers a decisive, dynamic relationship with the living Christ. Dr. James Stewart writes, That's what being Christian means, a vital relationship to a living person. He continues, I feel sure it needs to be said today quite unequivocally that if, as Christians, we hope to grow in grace and walk the way of faith and hope and love, the prior condition is that our own life should be intertwined with the life of Jesus. The indispensable center of Christianity is Christ, and we ruin our religion if we center it any, anywhere else. We have something more than mere ideology. Our ideology is the loftiest and most demanding of any, but we have something so much more than that. We have a living, eternally present Lord to set our hearts on fire, to love and to be loved by forever. And Dr. John A. Mackay writes, A Christian filled with the Holy Spirit is the redemptive counterpart of the fanatical devotee of political religion. People consumed by the inner fire of the Spirit are the counterpart in human life of the smashed atom which releases cosmic force. It is not enough that I hear the word of God and obey it. It is necessary that the word of God become incarnate in my flesh in a spiritual sense, that Christ be formed in me, revealed in me, and not simply to me. What we need in a word within the Christian church, if the church is to match this hour, is Christians who are utterly Christian, in whom the full potentiality of spiritual life becomes manifest. And that means learning to live day by day, moment by moment, in the actual living companionship of Jesus Christ our Lord. For a believer to deprive himself of that intimate fellowship with Christ is like depriving the lungs of oxygen or a fish of its natural habitat, the water, and just as disastrous. When John Wesley, graduate of Oxford, erudite scholar, ordained priest of the Anglican Church, was on his way to the American colonies, a horrible storm swooped down upon the ship in which he sailed across the Atlantic. He was terrified. After the storm had passed, he turned to a fellow passenger. He was either of the Church of the Brethren or a Mennonite. Wesley inquired, Were you equally terrified? And the other said, Why, no. I know Jesus Christ. And then this piercing question he addressed to Wesley, Do you know him? Wesley did not answer, for in his heart he knew he did not know Jesus. He knew the doctrine. He could recite the Apostles' Creed, but he did not know Christ. He had written in his diary concerning the reason for going to the colony of Georgia to serve the Indians, quote, My chief motive, to which all the rest are subordinate, is the hope of saving my soul. While in Georgia, he wrote to friends, 
In vain have I fled from myself to America. I still groan under the intolerable weight of inherent misery. Go where I will, I carry my hell about me, nor have I the least ease in anything. As he left Georgia to return to England, he exclaimed, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Who? And as he landed in England, he wrote in his diary, It is now two years and almost four months since I left my native country in order to teach the Georgian Indians the nature of Christianity. But what have I learned myself in the meantime? Why, what I least of all suspected, that I who went to America to convert others was never myself converted to God. Later, as you know, he found his heart strangely warmed as he shared in a prayer meeting and Bible study at Aldersgate. From that strange warming of his heart, he became an evangelist with a burning heart, as one of his biographers calls him. This man who came to know Jesus Christ was never content with only an initial introduction to Jesus. He learned to live consciously in the presence and companionship of the living Christ in an ever-increasing intimacy of knowledge. He traveled by foot or horseback some 250,000 miles preaching the gospel. He wrote more than 200 books. He preached some 40,000 times or more and was used of God, as you know, to initiate one of the greatest moral revolutions and spiritual revivals in all the history of humanity. The secret of his life and of his voluminous work was found in his vital dynamic relationship with a living person, the living Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose companionship he spent some four to five hours every morning before he began other work. When I asked how he found time to spend so many hours in prayer and meditation each day and still accomplish all that he did, he answered that it would have been, been simply utterly impossible to contemplate any of that work without those hours spent daily in fellowship with the living Christ. Now, if I have spent a lot of time on this emphasis, it is because I sincerely believe that not until we and those to whom and with whom we minister discover the power and the overflow of such intimacy with Christ day by day. I am convinced that it is out of this overflow that we experience an absolute necessity for every Christian and for every church, and that is a compelling sense of mission. A compelling sense of mission. It was this sense of mission that consumed and propelled our Lord himself. When the disciples chided him for being out in a solitary place praying, when all men are seeking you, he announced, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other cities also, for thereunto am I sent. When the disciples begged him to eat, he explained his lack of physical hunger by saying, My meat, my food, my satisfaction is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. In John 5, 23, Jesus calls upon all to honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Going on to add, He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father who sent him. In John chapter 6, Jesus declares, And this is the will of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. A profoundly significant word from Christ is John 8, 42. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. 
And one more, John 17, 3. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And if you read the Gospel of John, you will discover that more than 40 times in that one Gospel, Jesus refers to the fact that he was sent by God upon a specifically designated mission. And it was under that compulsion of mission, of having been sent of God to accomplish a specific mission, that the zeal of thine house consumed him. And then, in that upper room after the resurrection, he appeared to the disciples and breathed on them, saying, Receive ye the Holy Spirit, and added, As the Father hath sent me, so send I you. Our Christ-given mission in the world is one with Christ's God-given mission in the world. His mission in the world gives us the pattern, purpose, character, the scope, and the measure of our mission. The as of love for a lost world. The as of devotion and absorption in the great business of a world's redemption. The as of self-sacrifice which Christ manifested for the salvation of men is to have its counterpart in the soul of love, devotion, of abandonment to the work and self-sacrifice for the same great purpose, the reaching of the world for its redemption, for its reconciliation with God. Our mission then is peculiarly and essentially a stewardship. The gospel has been committed to us in trust to give to the world. This stewardship is not an annex. It is the essential life, the first essential of Christian fidelity. This relationship to Christ is vital. It is not simply an association with him in his cause. It is identification with him. It is oneness of life with him in his redemptive mission. Let us forever remember and remind ourselves daily or even more frequently, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bring forth fruit. As the Father hath sent me, so send I you. And until you and I and the churches have this sense of compelling mission, we will not be global-minded, mission-oriented, and mission-actioned as we ought to be. The third aspect of the pastor's role in leading the church to be mission-minded is the gripping conviction of the perfect adequacy and the absolute onlyness of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. As I have studied growing churches around the world, I have seen one foundational characteristic of all that are really growing. It is this conviction of the onlyness and the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. It is basic to the compelling sense of mission, and actually that sense of mission grows out of this conviction concerning the onlyness and the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. We live in a world of terrifying needs, of frightening problems, of unrelenting anxieties, the only adequate message is Jesus Christ. Thinking of the world's darkness, both intellectual and spiritual darkness, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If any man follows me, he shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Moved with deep compassion by seeing the world's hungry and destitute, Jesus promised, I am the bread of life. Contemplating the insatiable thirst, reflective of the total inadequacy of things and position to satisfy the deepest needs of the soul, Jesus guaranteed, I am the water of life. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst again. With heartbrokenness because of man's lostness, Jesus assured us, 
I am the way, the new and living way, as the writer to the Hebrews says, the way to life in its fullness of significance and joy, and the way from all that alienates and destroys. Grieving with those who mourn their dead, Christ Jesus affirms, I am the resurrection and the life. These great things said Jesus concerning himself to declare to us his perfect adequacy to satisfy our deepest needs. As a young woman came in response to the invitation one Sunday morning with a broken heart because of her emptiness, she said, I need everything he can give. And she found in him her all-sufficient Savior and delights not only to worship him, but to serve him in continuing ministries. Not only are we moved to share the gospel of Christ with others because of our conviction of his perfect adequacy to meet our every need, but we are are also impelled by our conviction concerning the absolute onlyness of Jesus as Savior. I am the way, the truth, the lie, and the clincher. No one comes to the Father except by me. On another occasion, he insisted, except you believe that I am he, the Messiah Redeemer, you shall die in your sins. And Peter boldly proclaimed to the Sanhedrin, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And I am so glad that Jesus also promised, Whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise reject or cast out. We can come with assurance of acceptance, of forgiveness, of renewal, of recreation, of life. These two facts call us to be missionary. Without Christ, men are lost. For how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear unless there be preachers, witnesses? And how shall they preach or witness unless they be sent? Emil Bruner commented, The greatest sin of the church and the one which causes the greatest distress is that she withholds the gospel from the world and from herself. From herself? Yes. For that which we do not share, we forfeit. But as Stuart said, and we quoted the first night, a church that knows its Lord and is possessed by its gospel cannot but propagate creatively the life it has found. A Christian who is taking his faith seriously cannot but evangelize. Frederick W.H. Myers, in his great poem, St. Paul, has the apostle saying, oft when the word is only to, del to deliver, lifts the illusion and the truth lies bare. City or desert, multitude or throngs, only like folk I see the people there under. And then he says, slaves who should be free, servants who should be kings, hearing their one hope with an empty wonder. Then, like a trumpet call, shivers throughout me. Oh, to save these, to perish for their saving, be offered for them all. Fourth, the leadership of the Holy Spirit is essential in cultivating a mission-minded, mission-involved church. Luke in the Acts of the Apostles shows us the unmistakable guidance of the Holy Spirit in the missionary comprehension, expansion, and practice of the early churches. Jesus had promised, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses 
in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. World missions was clearly the command of Christ, but those Jewish Christians were slow to comprehend the fullness of their mission. Step by step, the Holy Spirit led them in the practice of missions to all. Perhaps their comprehension followed their practice. On the day of Pentecost, Peter had quoted Joel as an explanation of what was happening, declaring, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. But it took a good while for all people to include anyone beyond the Jews. Peter and Stephen both traced the highlights of God's dealings with Israel, showing in reality God's original intention to include all Gentiles as well as Jews in redemption. Still, the churches were slow to grasp this significance. With the coming of persecution, the disciples minus the apostles were scattered abroad, and they went everywhere talking the gospel. Yet, as Luke says, they preached the gospel to Jews only, except Philip. He went to the despised Samaritans, and the Holy Spirit blessed with amazing results. Philip went on to Gaza, led of the Spirit, and there the Ethiopian eunuch was saved, evangelized, and Philip was caught away by the Spirit and continued to evangelize in the towns and villages from Gaza to Joppa to Caesarea. Soon, Peter visited these new church groups to be sure they were indeed believers and to strengthen them in their faith. In so doing, he came to Joppa, and there he showed some remarkable growth and progress in his own experience as he went into the house of Simon the Tanner, who was also a believer. Jewish custom forbade any relationship with the Tanner, for due to his stinky business, he was considered almost as unclean as a leper. Peter, as a Christian brother, rose above that carnal prohibition and went to be a guest in Simon's house. There came to him messengers sent by Cornelius in response to God's reply to his spiritual quest. Peter, now understanding the thrice-repeated vision, went with the Gentile servants to the house of Cornelius, where again, contrary to Jewish law and custom that he had so far observed, went into the house of a Gentile and ate with him and spent the night and several nights in that house. Thus it was that the wall of separation was finally being slowly breached. And Peter discovered and later, later preached to the church in Jerusalem God's intention for the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's heading up of all things in Christ Jesus. In the dispersion of the believers from Jer Jerusalem, some of the Hellenist Jews who had become believers went as far as Antioch of Syria, the third most important city in the Roman Empire. And they preached the gospel first to Jews only. And then, as the Holy Spirit led them, they began to preach to the Gentiles, and great multitudes became believers. And in Antioch it was that believers were first called Christians. The center of missionary enterprise shifted from Jerusalem to Antioch, and from Peter to Paul, whom Jesus had specifically designated as his messenger to the Gentiles. You remember that when Jesus appeared to Paul as he neared Damascus, and Paul responded with faith, asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? Jesus said to him, for this purpose, or I have appeared unto you for this purpose, to appoint you a minister and a witness, both of the things wherein you have seen me, and of the things in the which I will yet manifest myself unto you, delivering you from the people, the Jews, and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send you to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are justified 
by faith in Jesus Christ. Could a call be more specific, better defined? And my brethren, that call of Christ is to you and to me, just as it was to the Apostle Paul. Soon Paul and Barnabas, and then later Paul, Silas, Timothy, and others had become the leaders in missions to Asia and Europe as the church in Antioch was instructed by the Holy Spirit to separate unto me these men which I, for the work whereunto I have called them. And all of this was foreplanned by God before and as he called Abraham into cooperation with himself with the promise in you and your seed shall all the nations be blessed. As the Holy Spirit led them, so does he lead us to be witnesses to the uttermost part of the earth, whether that uttermost part be in our home community or in Burma or Africa. A few years ago, Rodney Stone in an Ohio city secured a job as rent collector. He was retired and needed some extra income and secured a job as a rent collector in the apartments of a slum section of that city. And as he went from apartment to apartment each week to collect the weekly rent, his heart was deeply troubled and moved by the misery and suffering of the people living in those apartments and exploited by many of their owners. The only commerce he found in that whole area were bars and so-called adult movie houses. But one day he discovered a warehouse on the corner of a block that was vacant. He learned who the owner was and went to talk with him about using it for a mission, having already talked with his pastor and church, securing their promise to join with him in starting a preaching, teaching mission if they could obtain that building. And the owner said, if that's the purpose for which you want it, I will not only give you the building rent-free, I will pay the utilities. And after some weeks, they began their first service, and there were 67 present for the first meeting. And during the first year, more than 80 people were led to Christ. Now, the great thing about this story is Rodney Stone was 87 years of age and totally blind. And yet he felt compelled by the sense of mission and the leadership of the Holy Spirit to begin that work where today a church flourishes and people's lives are being changed and conditions are changed in the community because people have been changed. Cooperative involvement with others in missions is a fifth ingredient of a pastor's role in developing mission-mindedness. The prophet said one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. Nehemiah wrote, So built we the wall, for the people had a mind to work. A friend of mine was spending some time on the beach, and suddenly one day the lifeguard called to everyone on the beach to join hands in a human chain which he led out into the water in an attempt to save a victim of the undertow who was being carried farther and farther from safety and unable to overcome that current. And finally, when that human chain led by the lifeguard reached the victim, it was just in time to save his life. That which was impossible to one alone became gloriously and life-savingly possible when they join hands. Incumbent upon every church is the obligation to carry the gospel to every person in the entire world. 
as if that church were the only church, just as the church at Jerusalem was the only church when Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all the nations. And that which is impossible for one church alone becomes gloriously possible when we work together, when we pool our resources in personnel and giving and in intelligent planning under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And together we can do that which one church alone could never accomplish. The story of Gideon comes to mind. I love the story of Gideon. I can feel something, I think, maybe not as, as uh, tremendously as he felt it, of the disappointment and the heartbreak and the queasiness when his numbers were reduced from 32,000 to 10,000 to 300. How would you like to take 300 unequipped, untrained, unprepared men into battle against thousands of well-equipped, trained soldiers? Gideon had a problem too. But by faith in the ability to God to do that which man cannot do, he prepared those men for a night of victory. And on that night, 300 men in three companies of a hundred each together descended the mountainside until they were almost surrounding that camp. Together they broke their pitchers. Together they blew the trumpets. Together they lifted high their torches. Together they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And together, by the aid and power of God, those 300 men won a great victory. Now let's imagine something. Let's suppose those 300 had said, each one of them, I'm a Baptist. I'm free. I'm independent. Nobody's going to boss me around. Who does Gideon think he is that he can coerce us into cooperation? I'm a Baptist. I'm free. I'm independent. What kind of a victory would they have won? But when those 300 resolve to work together as one by the power of God that which was impossible was a glorious victory as we work together with our fellow churches and as the mission sending agencies of our associations conventions federations work together, we too, by the power of God and the leadership and enabling of the Holy Spirit, can carry the gospel to the people of this world. I am so thankful that Dr. Robert Berry is going to be meeting this weekend with representatives of two other Baptist missionary sending agencies in Bolivia as the three together, the three agencies with representatives from all three, talk together and pray together and plan together for a radio outreach from Bolivia to Spanish-speaking America. Many other signs and evidences of cooperation between convention-sending agencies are in evidence today, as he mentioned the on Monday, and how we praise God that through this cooperative endeavor, that which we alone could not do is becoming gloriously possible. One other thing, and that is, and it's all important, if we are to develop and inspire our fellow believers, we must pay the price of discipleship. I heard E. Stanley Jones some years ago tell of a Methodist preacher of whom he knew. He was a young man, talented, with a lot of charisma. 
He went to the annual meeting just knowing that they were finally going to recognize his superior abilities and send him to a better pastorate. He had been there several years in that little place, sort of neglected and off to the side and, and just kind of ignored. And now he was going to be recognized, he was sure. How crestfallen he was a few days later when he was returned to the same assignment. He was embittered and angry, heartbroken. He talked to a layman friend with whom he had a lot of rapport, and he said, they're just crucifying me here. And his friend looked him in the eye and said, the trouble is, Pastor, you haven't died. <laughs> you can imagine his reaction to that. But by the time he reached his study, his anger had cooled off. His soul searching had been conducted and he recognized the truth of what his layman friend had said. And he stayed on his knees until he died. And that year, Dr. Jones said, that young man led more than 100 people to Jesus Christ. We'll never be able to say with full meaning, Christ lives in me, until we can first of all truly say, I am crucified with Christ. Some years ago in Israel, I'd been preaching in the church in Nazareth for a week, and then we stayed an extra week, the musicians and I, and we went to small congregations in different sections of the country, most of them of Arab believers. We were up near the border of Lebanon one night. We preached and saw the glory of the Lord come down. Then as we returned, a two-hour drive back to Nazareth, as we drove southward, I looked to the east, and I saw a continuing string of lights on top of the hills or mountains for some 40 miles. And I asked Ray Register what in the world that was. I'd never seen those villages up there. And he said, well, there's 40 miles of villages on the tops of those hills and mountains. They're all Arabs. And so far as I know, he said, there's not a single witness for Jesus Christ in any one of those communities. The next day we were back in Jerusalem I went to the airline office to take care of our return passage, and on my way back to the hotel, I thought I'd take a shortcut through the old city, and it turned out to be a very long cut. And as I walked through those narrow, twisting streets, some places so narrow that I could reach out with my elbows and touch the walls on either side of me, I was surrounded by groups of some of the dirtiest little children I'd ever seen in my life. And they were all begging for alms, and I wanted to just shake them off and get where I could get a bath in Lysol very soon. And then it dawned on me that most of these children, their parents and their grandparents, in the city over which Jesus wept, had never so much as heard of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That afternoon, on the Mount of Olives, I looked out over the city and wept with my Lord. And then I walked down what they think is maybe the trail down which he rode the donkey into the city as the crowd shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. And a few days later, with disillusionment, cried, Crucify him, crucify him. And I thought about those hilltops and those little children and the countries of the world where Jesus is so little known. And I said, Lord, what is the hope and I came to a place called Gethsemane. 
I looked over the wall at an old olive tree that could have been standing, they tell me, when Jesus prayed. And there came a conviction saying, here is the secret. For when ver veritable believers of the world go on their knees before God with the prayer of Christ in Gethsemane, not my will, thy will be done, and be done by me and through me, then will the world hear and know Jesus Christ.